I ask the question, why then all the fear? Luke chapter 10, verses 16 through 20. And the King James text today reads, He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads one more time this afternoon as we look at why then all the fear. Master, Savior, King, and Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for salvation. We thank you, God, today that we can be assured by faith that our name appears in the Lamb's Book of Life that at the hour of judgment, Lord, we will be ushered into the joys of our Lord. We'll be ushered into that place. The Word of God declares that eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. We thank You, God, today for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, today for the faith that allows us to embrace this glorious gospel which is able to save our soul. The Word of God is at this moment in time broken open, O God, that it might feed the flock of God, the sheep, the lambs, Today, O oh God, we stand ready to receive that food from heaven which only the Holy Ghost can provide. O oh God, you've called men, women, individuals to declare and to preach the good news of the gospel. But we are but instruments in your hands. And if we will submit ourselves to the anointing, the presence and power of the Holy Ghost. You're able to use us, Lord, to deliver a word to your people that encourages, that inspires, that causes faith to rise up and well up within us, that is able to overcome all things that this world might throw at us. Master, today we're living in a difficult time, in a harsh time. Many things are going on in our nation, in our government, in our world, Lord, that we have no control over. And fear would attempt to grip the hearts of your people. Anxiety today, depression. The Lord today sent forth your word to deliver, to break the bondage of the enemy, to break the yoke today, O oh God, that Satan would try to place about our neck. Lord, we're a people of victory. We're a people of power. We're an overcoming people. Anoint the messenger and the hearer. Help us, O oh God, to deliver the word of the Lord and help us to receive the word of the Lord. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. I'm asking the question this afternoon. Why then all the fear? The message in so many churches today, the message coming out of so many preachers' mouths today, is 
a message of fear. It is not a message of victory. Christians are fed a steady diet of conspiracy theories and fear-inspiring warnings. We're told at every turn, all oh, evil is winning, the devil's winning, all oh, because uh, gay marriage has been approved. That, that's proof that the enemy is in control. Well, of course the enemy's in control, you idiot. The Word of God tells us that. My God, how stupid can people be that call themselves preachers of the gospel? How stupid can people be that call themselves people of God? Don't you believe the Word of God? Right. I don't believe for a moment that gay marriage is proof that the enemy is in control. I don't think that is an issue that demonstrates the enemy's position in our world. Nor do I believe that abortion being legal is evidence that the enemy is winning anything. The Word of God tells us today that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Yes. Even our faith is the victory yes. that overcomes the world. If God's people were living what God's people were called to live today, then I'm here to tell you things would be very different. Mm -hmm. But instead we have churches today that are preaching a message of fear, conspiracy, warning. They inspire anxiety. They inspire fear. Well, why do they do this? It's easy, Tommy, because fear sells. Fear sells seats. Fear fills seats. Fear raises money. Right. But the gospel is not a message of fear, but rather a message of overcoming victory in the face of all opposition. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. The Word of God said, but ye are more than conquerors through Christ. Hallelujah. Ye are more than conquerors. The Word of God declares, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This is a message of victory. What in the name of God has happened in the church that people will flood churches that preach a message of fear and anxiety and they will avoid and abstain from churches that preach a message of overcoming victory and power. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I was born and raised in the Pentecostal movement. I've had the baptism of the Holy Ghost spoken with other tongues as the Spirit of God give the utterance. Since I was a child, I believe the Pentecostal message today every bit as much as I ever believed the Pentecostal message. When I was a kid, preachers didn't preach politics. When I was a kid, preachers didn't speak all their time preaching uh, culture wars. When I was a kid, preachers didn't talk constantly about abortion and about uh, homosexuality and gay marriage. They used to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. They used to preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that baptism that the Word of God calls a baptism with power and with fire. They used to preach divine healing. And my God, how we used to see people healed. My Lord, I'll tell you, if you preach it, It'll happen. We're not seeing it happen today because they're no longer preaching it. You see, you've only got so much time in the pulpit on Sunday and you can't preach fear and you can't preach uh, conspiracy theories and you can't preach abortion and you can't preach homosexuality and you can't preach all the things that fill the offering plates and fill the pews, hello now, and still have time to preach Jesus. Right. Squeeze them out. I'll tell you something. Don't don't kid yourself, folks. 
This ministry has existed in Dallas, Texas now for almost 19 years. And we are as empty today practically as we were when we first started. We have had nothing but an uphill climb. And let me tell you, don't you gay, don't you LGBT folks act all holier than thou. Don't you act all self-righteous and say, oh, bless God, pastor's right. I'll tell you what, because y'all are every bit as guilty as the rest of them. You don't go and support churches that reach out to your LGBT neighbor. You don't go and support churches that reach out to people in your own community who are backslid and lost and dying and headed for a devil's hell. You don't go and support churches. You don't pay tithes to churches that are preaching a message that is aimed at helping to bring restoration and reconciliation to LGBT people. Oh no, no. You're too happy to go to that church that preaches the same fear-mongering garbage as everybody else. You know why? Because there you get to be a celebrity. Oh, there I get to sing. Uh, you see, I can't go to the affirming church. They don't have but a handful of people. I can go to Brother Jones' church, and he's got several hundred people. And I sing specials, and everybody thinks I'm wonderful. So I go there. Uh-huh. Wait till you stand before God in the judgment and let's see what He thinks of your motivations. Wait until you stand before the Lord in the judgment and He says, You were a Samaritan. You were someone that others cast aside, that others had no time for. And when you saw your fellow neighbor laying on the road, bleeding and dying, what did you do to help them? Nothing. Because you were more interested in fitting in with the priests and the Levites, hello now, than you were reaching out to that one who was hurting. I want to tell you something. I do what I do today. I can't say I do it because I enjoy it, because I don't. I don't enjoy it. I'd enjoy it a whole lot more if we had a whole lot more people who would get behind the vision that I have and would help us, Tommy, to get where we're trying to go. I'd enjoy it a whole lot better if that were the case. When I pastored my early churches in the quote-unquote mainstream, that was never a problem. That was never an issue. I never had one minute's problem getting people to support the vision that I put forth as the pastor. I never had one problem raising money for projects and things we were trying to do. Never had a single problem. Never had a problem getting people to tithe and support the work of God. Never had a problem. But we live in an age today when preaching a positive message, a hopeful message, preaching a message that offers uh, hope and inspiration rather than a message that offers fear and anxiety, uh, it doesn't sell as well. And I got news for you, it doesn't sell as well in the LGBT community either. I know LGBT people, I've been to some conferences, I've been to some meetings, I've watched preachers in the LGBT community get up, Tommy, and preach messages that uh, sound an awful lot like the mainstream, because they know what sells. I've watched LGBT people go into the altars, oh, and bawl and cry and carry on. I've watched people shout and scream and run the aisles and carry on and play church. And then the minute they walked out the door, they were just as worldly and just as ungodly and just as sinful as anybody outside of the church. They only played church while they were in church minute they walked outside things changed. Well I'm sorry I'm not going to say that from the minute I came back to God after being out of church for a few years uh, 
I'm not going to say that I've done everything right, that I've always acted right, and I've always behaved right. No, I didn't. But I'll tell you one thing. I got right. Hallelujah. Yes, I made yes. sure. Because I'm going to tell you something. Uh, this old preacher boy, this old child of God, I just can't live the hypocrite the hypocrite's lifestyle. I cannot live uh, one life and talk another. I can't act like I'm doing one thing and live something different. It's just not in me to do that. I can't do that. I knew what was right. I knew the right way to behave. I knew the right, right way to act. I knew the right way to believe. And from the minute I came back in, that's the direction I was headed in. Took me a while to get there. I'm not going to lie. Took me a while to get there. But I'm still headed in that direction. Amen. Amen. I'm still walking in that direction. We live in a day today when fear sells and fear fills offering plates and fear fills pews but the word of God said God hath not given us the spirit of fear fear is not a selling point of the gospel fear is not an element of the gospel fear is not something that the child of God or the preacher of the gospel is supposed to trade in. No, we're supposed to trade in love. Right. We're supposed to trade in hope. We're supposed to trade in faith. We're supposed to trade in compassion, gentleness, meekness. Am I telling the truth today? Oh, I want to tell you folks, it disturbs me greatly as someone who grew up. i got to take my jacket off. I'm burning up today and I don't know why. I'm so hot today. Must be this shirt. <laughs> Amen. Okay. I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. Let me tell you folks, Pentecostal movement does not mean that we merely believe in speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. The Pentecostal movement, the Pentecostal message is not merely a message of the baptism of the Holy Ghost as was experienced by the apostles and the early church on the day of Pentecost, which is why it's called Pentecostal, because it is as on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Holy Ghost was experienced. Uh, I'm not Pentecostal today simply because I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire. I'm not Pentecostal today just simply because I believe in speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. I am not Pentecostal today simply because I believe in the gifts of the Spirit as I read from the Word of God earlier in our service today. Word of knowledge, uh, uh, Word of of wisdom, uh, discernment of spirits, so on and so forth. Uh, that that those things are not what defines Pentecostal alone, but Pentecostal is defined by the conviction that the God we read about in the Book of Acts is the same God we serve today. That the same God who filled believers in the Book of Acts with the infilling and baptism of the Holy Ghost is the same God who baptizes with the Holy Ghost today. The same God who causes believers to speak with other tongues in the book of Acts causes believers today to speak with other tongues. The same God who healed the sick, cleansed the leper, raised the dead in the book of Acts still heals the sick, cleanses lepers, and raises the dead today. Amen. I'll tell you, I remember I had a friend in ministry in the church of God, a dear lady. And she and her husband pastored a church. They were marvelous people. I loved them dearly. I still love them dearly. Because of who I am, they won't have anything to do with me. But I love them dearly. 
because hate has to go two ways, and I refuse to let it flow back for me. Amen. Mm -hmm. You can be as ugly and stupid and foolish as you want to be, but honey, it's on you because I ain't going to give it back to you. I'm still going to love you regardless of what you think about me. And this dear lady one time in their church, a gentleman came up for prayer and he kind of grasped in his chest and he fell to the floor. And one of their church members was a long, many years, a nurse. And she went down and she began to check on him because it was obvious it wasn't the Holy Ghost, it was something physical. And he had no pulse, he was not breathing. She looked up and said, Dear God, this man is dead. And the church, the pastor said, let's get around him. And they got around that man, and they began to pray, Tommy. And she reached down, she grabbed hold of that man's hand, and she said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come to life. And she pulled up on his arm, and when she did, he sprung up on his feet. Because the church in the book of Acts is still the church we live in today. And it will be the church until Jesus comes. It's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm Pentecostal today because not only do I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Not only do I believe in speaking with other tongues. Not only do I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Not only do I believe God still heals the sick, cleanses the leper, raises the dead. And I still believe God's the one who causes the ground to quake when His servants are cast into prison and they begin to worship Him at the top of their lungs. Hallelujah. In the middle of the midnight hour. Read the book of Acts. It's there. Hallelujah. I believe that we're still the church that God sends angels to deliver His minister from the deepest prison. He sends an angel to that deepest prison and causes the door to swing open so Peter can emerge. And Peter walks out, just walks out. Heads to a prayer meeting where folks are praying for him. Shocks them to death. Showing up at the door. Because even though they were praying for God to do something. Like so many Christians they were shocked when God did. Hello now. Oh. I want to tell you today. If I'm Pentecostal, if I genuinely believe that the God of Acts is the God I serve today, if Jesus Christ, the Word of God declares, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if the same God of Acts is the same God of the church today, then why would I not believe that God would send an angel to deliver me should I need it? Why would I not believe that God would send an earthquake to set me free if I needed it. Hello now. Why would I not believe that God would speak through prophecy to allow me advance warning? You remember how they lowered Paul down the side of the wall in the basket so he could get out of town? Why would I not believe God would warn me the same way he warned them for Paul? See, if I believe those things, if I believe the Pentecostal message today like I ought to believe the Pentecostal message, then guess what, Tommy? Nothing in this world could possibly cause me to be fearful. Right. Because I would understand what I read in the book of Luke today, chapter 10. He that heareth you, heareth me. Hallelujah. Oh my God, you don't realize how powerful that statement Jesus just made is. His disciples came back to him all excited because demons listened to them. When they employed the name of Jesus, demons from hell listened to them. Jesus said, He that heareth you, heareth me. Uh -huh. Ooh, he just said a lot. Do you remember when I taught on Paranormal 101? 
You remember when we talked about demon possession and we talked about these kind of things? You remember when I told you that if you know who Jesus is and you're operating in the authority of Jesus' name, in the power and in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that when you come up against a demon, that demon's not hearing your voice, it's hearing Jesus' voice. Hallelujah. That comes right from the Word of God, honey, because the Word of God said, He that heareth you, heareth me. That includes devils, honey. Why then all the fear? What are you afraid of? If demons can't even hear you from the voice of Jesus coming out of you, what are you afraid of? My God have mercy. He that heareth you, heareth me. He that despiseth you, despiseth me. He that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Anyone who despises the man Jesus Christ despises the Spirit of Almighty God. You can't despise the man Jesus Christ without despising God. Do you right. follow what I'm saying? That's what Jesus was saying. He that despises you despises me. He that despises me despises him that sent me. See, if you despise the man Jesus Christ, you despise God. Well, no, I don't, because I don't believe Jesus is God. You don't have to believe Jesus is God. Fact's a fact. Amen. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. Hallelujah. The truth of the matter is, if you despise Him, honey, you despise God. And the 70 returned again with joy. Again with joy. Again with joy. Oh, hallelujah. They had done this before. Ha-ha! <laughs> This in the first time. Glory to God. They returned again with joy. Oh Lord, I can't believe it's happening again. Glory. The devils still tremble. The devils still run. They still flee. When we speak the name of Jesus with authority against them. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, it's exciting every time. I've cast out a number of demons in my day. Every time I come against a devil and God gives us the victory through the power of the Holy Ghost in the authority of Jesus' name, it's as exciting this time as it was the last time. Hallelujah. It, there's something about it that just sets your soul on fire. They came back again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Notice he did not say that he beheld or that he cast Satan from heaven. Notice he did not say we beheld Satan as though there were plural, that there were more than one watching it happen. He said, I beheld Satan. What happened to Satan? I beheld him fall from heaven as lightning. You see, Satan could not do what he did and magnify himself above all that is called God and still be able to stand in the presence of God. The Word of God tells us to lay aside the weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Have you ever read that passage? You know why? Because that weight and that sin will hold you back. It will tie you down. You don't need God to do anything. The weight and the sin will hold you back. When Satan exalted himself against all that is called God and desired to be as God, immediately he began to fall. 
Oh, hallelujah. I hope you're hearing me today. Immediately, he immediately began to fall from heaven because he could no longer stand in the presence of God. He was no longer uh, living and doing and being all that he had been created to be. All of a sudden, there was a weight and there was a sin that was tied about him and it began to drag him and it dragged him fast. Hallelujah. He fell as lightning from heaven, the Word of God declares. Jesus said, I watched it happen. I stood there and watched it happen. I saw him when his heart changed. I saw him when he allowed his motivations to be overcome with evil and wickedness. And I saw him fall from heaven as lightning. Said, y'all get excited when demons submit to you because you use my name. He said, I beheld Satan fall from heaven as lightning. You think what you saw was exciting? <laughs> you should have seen what I saw. But listen, behold, I give unto you power. Oh, hallelujah. He didn't say, behold, I give unto you fear. Behold, I give unto you anxiety. Behold, I give unto you conspiracy. That's right. He said, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Mm, serpents and scorpions. What do serpents and scorpions represent? I'll tell you what they represent. They represent natural opponents and natural enemies. Serpents and scorpions are not supernatural. No, they exist in the real world. I've been living in Texas now. I came here originally when I was a teenager way back in 1982. And I remember one time I was renting a little house in East Texas and I heard a shuffling in my fireplace. There was a piece of paper in there kind of crumpled up and I heard something in the fireplace, you know. And I went over and I looked and by God there was a scorpion in there walking on the paper, Tommy. And I could hear that stinking scorpion. And man, there ain't nothing in this world scared the death out of you worse than seeing a scorpion. And I tell them the truth. There ain't nothing that people tend to be more afraid of than serpents and scorpions. But neither one of those things are supernatural. True. No, they both exist in the natural world. But Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. He said, Honey, even things in this natural world that normally could hurt you and harm you and cause you great pain and distress and potentially even take your life. I'm giving you power over these natural enemies. Ooh. Lord, why then all the fear? Well, Lord, if, if you've given us power over serpents and scorpions, why in the world are preachers preaching fear? Why in the world are God's people running around in fear? Why are people so afraid of what's going on in the world when you've already said you gave us power over serpents and scorpions to tread upon them? Am I telling the truth today? But listen, he went on. That's not all. He said, I give you power. Behold... I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Then he said, and over all the power of the enemy. Hallelujah. Natural and supernatural. Why then all the fear? Why then is the message in so many churches today fear? Why? Are we telling God's people to be afraid? The enemy's taking charge. The enemy's doing this. The enemy's doing that. Oh, bless God. <laughs> Wickedness and evil. <laughs> He's given us power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. He's given us power over all the power of the enemy.
Oh my God, listen. And nothing, 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 nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'm Pentecostal today because I believe the God of Acts is the God of today. I'm Pentecostal today because I believe that the Jesus we read about in the book of Acts is the same Jesus I serve today. He still saves. He still fills with the Holy Ghost. He still causes to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. He still heals broken bodies. He still cleanses lepers. He still raises the dead. He still delivers from prison cells. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. He still gives prophetic warning so that we can get out of Dodge before there's any trouble. Right. Oh my God, have mercy. Nothing shall by any means hurt. Well, isn't that funny? In the book of Acts, there's any number of incidents where things occurred where God's people could have been desperately wounded or killed. And yet, they were prevented any injury because God acted on their behalf. That's the same God I serve today. He's given me power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. He's given me power over all the power of the enemy. All the power. I don't care how the devil comes in us. We have power over all the power of the enemy. It doesn't matter what he does. Listen. I'm not very hopeful about what's going on in our nation right now. We've got a man in the White House who is demon-possessed. And I'm not kidding. I am not joking. I do not say those words lightly. I am not trying to be hyperbolic. I am being as honest as I can be. That man has demons. You do not lie the way he lies without having a lying spirit. You do not deceive the way that man deceives without having a deceiving spirit. You do not sow seeds of discourse between discord between citizens of one nation the way that man has sown seeds of discord between liberals and conservatives, the way that man has tried to pit one side against the other to the point of virtually stirring people up to a rabid, murderous mindset. You don't do that without having a demon, folks. Trust me. Why do you think when he has his meetings that the people go it's almost like they're at a demonic revival meeting. They go nuts. They start cursing and cussing. And the F word is flying. And they're chucking their middle fingers. Um, uh, that's not God, folks. i got news for you. I've never seen that one time happen in a church meeting. Right. I've never seen that one time happen in a revival meeting. I'm not very hopeful about what's going to happen. Come November, I'm not very hopeful about what's coming to our nation in the next several months. I'm not very hopeful for what is going to transpire, but I'm not fearful either. Did you hear me? Oh, well, but Pastor, you believe we may very well wind up with a full-blown civil war on our hands? Yep, yeah, we sure might. Well, doesn't that make you afraid? Doesn't that make you anxious? No. Why not? Because I serve the same God that Peter served. I serve the same God that Paul served. I serve the same God of the book of Acts. I serve the same God that gave his people warning. Honey, I've known this mess was coming for years and years and years. I've been getting ready for this mess for years and years and years. If you haven't, it's because you're not walking in the power of the Holy Ghost. You're not walking in the prophetic. You're not walking as God would have had you to walk. Because if you were, you'd have no anxiety whatsoever. Because Tommy can tell you, 
Anybody that's been part of our church over the last 10 years can tell you, I've been saying exactly what is coming for years and years and years. I said a, a decade ago, at least nearly a decade ago, that there were, and I specifically use these words, that there were white nationalist and white supremacist groups, did I not, Tommy, that were lying in wait for the perfect opportunity to rise up and to start a race-based civil war in this country. I've been saying that for, uh, it might be a decade, maybe a little less, I'm not sure. I specifically said white supremacist and white nationalist groups. Specifically. I specifically said it would be race-based. I specifically said when, uh, as uh, Obama was leaving office, I said all hell is going to break out in this country. I said as he's leaving office, all hell is going to break out in this country. Donald Trump couldn't even wait to get into office before he was already getting in the way of things. Before there were already rumblings of Russia helping him to get elected. Before uh, we begin to see all kinds of racial incidents occurring around the country. We've seen more mass shootings. We've seen more things happen. And people are shooting people and they're quoting Donald Trump as they do it. Has all hell broken out in America since Obama left office? You better believe it has. Things were not like they are now when Obama was in, were they? Am I afraid? No. Why would I be afraid? Why should I be afraid? I have nothing to be afraid of. God's given me power over to tread upon serpents. He's given us power to tread upon scorpions. He's given us power over all the power of the enemy. He's told us that nothing shall by any means hurt us. In Mark 16, 15 through 18, the Word of God said, Jesus is speaking, and He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, first thing, they shall cast out devils. First thing on the list. Why should I be afraid? Why then all the fear? In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, new languages. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Why should I be afraid? What's there to be afraid of? In Acts chapter 20, excuse me, Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 through 31, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. So for those foolish people who want to believe, and I've, we've had members in this very church who wanted to believe that the body and the soul were one and the same thing. Well, I don't know how that's possible if Jesus said, don't be afraid of somebody that kills the body but's not able to kill the soul. How can they be the same thing? But rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Let me ask you a question. If your soul and your body are destroyed, what remains? The spirit. Man is comprised of three elements, body, soul, and spirit. So if the body and the soul and the spirit, if you destroy the body and the soul, that leaves one thing, the spirit. Am I telling the truth? So guess what, honey? Hell's real. Hell's hot. Heaven's real. The Bible said Jesus went into hell after he died after he was crucified he descended into hell and this is what the scripture said and he preached unto the spirits there 
not the souls, the spirits there. For those Jehovah's Witness people who want to believe, oh no, there's no soul, there's no eternal soul. The Bible said the soul that sinned it shall die. It sure will, but the spirit will live. The Bible calls the dwelling of the spirit the second death. Let's continue. Jesus said, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and uh, soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Fear ye not, therefore. Why then all the fear? Why do we have preachers preaching fear? Why do we have Christians embracing fear? Why is there so much fear in the church? Jesus said, you ain't got nothing to be afraid of except one thing, and that is having your body and soul destroyed in hell. That's the only thing you got to worry about. Said, aside from that thing, the thing in the world you need to worry about. Why then all the fear? I've given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. In Acts chapter 27, verses 21 through 26, Paul is on a ship. He's being carried to the authorities to be tried. And a great storm arises. Listen. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss, meaning the shipwrecking. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. What? <laughs> Our ship is breaking up, Paul. We're about to experience shipwreck. We're all going to die. We're all going to drown. And you're telling us to be happy? Listen to why Paul said they should be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. He said, we're going to lose the ship, but not one person on this boat is going to die. Be of good cheer. Because the ship will go down, but not one soul will be lost. How do I know? Verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, what? Fear not! Hallelujah, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Paul said, fellas, look up, because I believe the God I serve. He sent an angel to let me know the ship's going down, but not one man among us will die. We're going to wind up on an island, but we're all going to live. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, the same God I serve, Tommy, is the same God today who's able to send an angel and let me know everything's going to be all right. Hallelujah. This storm, too, will pass. This darkness, too, will pass. What's happening in our country right now is going to pass. But God is able to give us warning. He's able to give us foreknowledge. He's able to speak to us prophetically and to help us to make preparation so that we can survive the storm and I tell them the truth oh if the God I serve is the God of the book of Acts then why all the fear Acts chapter 19 verses 13 through 16 then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits 
the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Why then all the fear? I can answer that question today. Because the preachers who are preaching fear and the Christians who are embracing fear don't know Jesus and Jesus doesn't know them. The sons of Sceva knew about Jesus but they didn't know Jesus. Right. They'd heard about Jesus through Paul. They were trying, they said, well, you know, we'll, 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 we'll try to use the same tactic this man Paul uses to cast out demons. But when they tried it, the demons said, um, wait a minute, I know Jesus and I know Paul. Did you hear me now? I know Jesus and I know Paul. He that heareth you heareth me. If you're living what you ought to be living, if you're being what you ought to be being, then the enemy doesn't hear you, he hears Jesus. If the enemy's not hearing Jesus coming out of your mouth, oh my God, That might explain why you're overcome with fear. That might explain why the enemy is able to pounce on you and cause you to run out of the house naked. Because you know what? You're not who you ought to be. The churches and the preachers who are preaching fear are doing so, Tommy, because they are not who they ought to be. Right. If we're living what we ought to be living, if we're believing what we ought to be believing, if we're embracing today what we ought to be embracing, then there is absolutely no room in the universe today for fear. There's no need for fear. Why then all the fear? What are you afraid of? I'm going to tell you, when I got word, Tommy told me the other day how that Justice Ginsburg had died, and obviously my heart was sickened and saddened. I bless her heart. I knew she had tried so hard to hang in there until, God willing, we got a new president. And, and uh, you know, she knew that the situation in our country was desperately bad. But Tommy told me this news. Normally, I'd have had a fit. I'd have, normally, I'd have been just blowing my stack and, you know, and, and just kind of freaking out over things. But God had already given me this message. And immediately, immediately, when Tommy told me that, immediately the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, ain't nothing to be afraid of. Hallelujah. Ain't nothing to be afraid of. I got news for you, honey. All these people who keep running around say, oh, let's go. The Supreme Court's going to be changed for the next 50 years. Um, have you ever played Monopoly? I like Monopoly. I, sometimes, not a lot, but every once in a while I like to play it on my computer. I just play against the computer, you know. One thing I've learned about life, literally, through Monopoly, believe it or not, you can't count on nothing. <laughs> About the time you get a big windfall and all this money comes your way and all this greatness comes your way and all these wonderful things come your way, without fail, that's when you wind up going to jail six times in a row. Am I telling the truth? Without fail, that's when you roll three doubles five times in a row. And you wind up going to jail. And you find yourself, one minute you're so far ahead, and the next minute you're so far behind. One minute you're wealthy beyond your greatest imagination, and the next minute you're broke. And you're going bankrupt. 
If there's anything Monopoly's taught me, it's that life is so uncertain. People are foolish to say, well, but these people Donald Trump's appointing, they, they, they can live for another 30 years, they can serve on the bench for another 30 years, yeah, and they can drop dead of a heart attack two days after uh, Joe Biden gets sworn in as president, too. Especially if God wills it so. Hello now. Why then are we so fearful? Why do we always assume the worst? Why do we always assume that the devil is somehow or another going to win this battle because we see him win the fight, so we assume he'll win the battle. Oh, honey, you may win a battle now and again, but that don't mean you've won the war. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Oh, I want to tell you today, there is no purpose, there is no reason for God's people today to be fearful. Whatever comes tomorrow, whatever comes to our nation, whatever comes to our government, whatever comes in the days ahead, children, do not be fearful. Let those who aren't living what they ought to be living be afraid. Let those who are not being true, biblical, spirit-filled, empowered Christians, let them be the ones to run around like chickens with their heads chopped off, terrified. But let us walk as God's people in victory and in power, knowing that God has given us power over all the works of the enemy. Amen. Amen. Over all the power of the enemy. I end my message this afternoon with this promise from Isaiah 41 and verse 10. This is the Spirit of the Lord speaking to the church today. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Hallelujah. Why then? All the fear, which is that?